Hello, and welcome to Awk, Hack the Planet's Text. My name is Ben Porter, and I'll be presenting today on one of my favorite programming languages and productivity tools of all time. To so many people, Awk is an esoteric, obscure tool that they know does powerful things, but they aren't familiar with it too much themselves. I used to be in this camp until one day I found a copy of the Awk book and devoured it in an afternoon. Those were some of the best spent hours of my life, as Awk has paid for itself many times over with productivity and efficiency boosts. I hope for those of you who are new to Awk that I may be able to help you experience some of that same excitement today. As I said, my name is Ben Porter, and I am an OpenShift consultant with Red Hat. Uh, if you've never heard of OpenShift, it's pretty neat. It's basically a platform as a service for Kubernetes, but I won't go into that today. But uh, it's definitely cool. If you haven't heard of it, you should check it out. I've been a Fedora user for many years, and I contribute to quite a bit of open source. Uh, most recently, I am running Fedora on my PinePhone Braveheart edition. So um, that's, that's me. I'm on Keybase uh, or email if you want to reach out to me. I was told that this version with the mustache was a must include, so I did. But anyway, you're not here to learn about me. You're here to learn about Ock, right? So let's uh, take a look at a quick outline of what we're going to do today. Uh, before we get into Ock and how to use it and what it is, I want to talk about why you would even care and kind of what Ock is and go over some of the history and, and whatnot. Because at least for me, I feel like having historical background makes it a lot easier to understand not only some of the quirks with tools, but also why I would care and, uh, you know, kind of their importance and place. Then we're going to look at some very simple Auk programs. And then we're going to take a look at patterns and actions in more depth. Then we'll dive a little bit deeper into Auk and take a look at some uh, real example programs. And then we'll build the graphic that's on the right. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. That was not made with Auk, but... Uh, so before we get into the details of Awk, let's start by asking ourselves a simple question. Why learn Awk? Well, there's a number of good reasons, and these are just some of them that I listed. But Awk is part of POSIX, which means it is installed everywhere. Every server you have, every embedded device, even your Android phone, all of those devices are going to have Awk in some form. There are lots and lots of problems that we face that are just text processing issues. And Awk is optimized for text processing. So it's a great tool for that job. Awk is also the gold standard of text processing tools. Awk is super powerful with a great expressive language, and it doesn't take very much to get it done. If you can do it with Awk, you're going to be able to do it quickly and effectively. Also, people are impressed with others when they use Awk. Awk will make you very powerful. And of course, all real hackers use Awk. So what exactly is Awk? You've probably thought of Awk as a command line tool at one point, or currently do. And you may have thought of Awk as a programming language, which I would say that it is. But to put it very succinctly, Awk is a powerful scripting language that's optimized for text processing. So it's got one job and it does it well, kind of like the Unix approach. Um, a more formal definition of awk would be that awk is a data-driven scripting language consisting of a set of actions to be taken against streams of textual data for purposes of extracting or transforming text, such as producing formatted reports. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying it's a scripting language that is very much structured around processing text. Awk was originally written by Alfred Aho, Peter Weinberger, and Brian Kernahan of uh, K&R fame. And it was originally developed in 1977. Uh, the Wikipedia page on Awk is actually pretty good if you're interested in learning more about that. So in 85 to 88, Awk was significantly revised and expanded uh, and written into the GNU version of Awk. So GNU Awk, which is often abbreviated as Gawk, uh, was written by a few newer people, and one of them is uh, Richard Stallman of RMS fame. And something that's important to note here is that Gawk is the most widely deployed version. This is, this is kind of important to know because there are subtle differences between them. But Awk has been maintained solely by Arnold Robbins since 94. It hasn't changed a whole lot, uh, but it is around. Uh, so in the early 90s, Brian Kernighan wrote 
NOC or new OC. And that one importantly carried a BSD license. Uh, whereas as you can imagine, the GNU OC used the GPL. A lot of BSD systems don't like to use GNU OC and GPL licensed software. And so a lot of times on a BSD derived system, which would include Macintosh, Mac OS, they will have the new awk version, but we do know that most users will end up installing Gawk, so uh, there you have it. But uh, that's kind of an important thing to know. So is awk a programming language? Uh, yes, yes it is. You can think of it as a command line tool, but it really is quite a full programming language. It's not meant to be a general purpose language, of course. It is very much optimized for text processing. But it is Turing complete, so you can write any program in it. And I've seen some fairly sophisticated aux scripts, but it's not a pleasant experience. And you can really, as we get into it, you'll really see how aux shines for text processing and isn't great for other things. So a quick overview of the history here. Before aux was said, and said was the scripting part of ed, but said was really the first very powerful regular expression tool. And said brought an interesting paradigm in that it used a main loop with current line variables. Awk took this approach, which worked very well. In fact, you probably use said a lot today. I know I do. And Awk took that approach and then kind of evolved it to be a little bit more powerful. Awk did such an amazing job that it's also kind of inspired other languages. So this is one of the nice things about looking back at history is we get to see the impact that Awk had on history, even though Awk is still around. Awk really directly inspired the language Perl, which at this point has somewhat of a bad reputation, but Perl is a fantastic language and it definitely had its place. And Perl took a lot of the same ideas from Awk, but tried to incorporate more of a general purpose nature to it. And then Perl in turn inspired some extremely beautiful languages in my subjective opinion, such as Ruby. I am a huge fan of Ruby. And Ruby itself has inspired other languages like Elixir and Crystal, that sort of thing. So we have a lot to thank Awk for. Even if you don't use Awk, there's still a reason to be fond of it for historical contributions. Okay, it's traditional to look at a hello world program in any new language, so we're gonna go ahead and do that. It's very simple. Don't be thrown off by the syntax yet. We're gonna dive into what these do, but there you have it. There's your hello world. Okay, before we actually start writing any awk code, let's talk about how you would actually run it. So that way, if you're trying to follow along, you can. There's a few different ways to run it. The first way at the top here, you can see uh, you pass the awk program or the script in as the first argument, and then the remaining arguments will be your input files. Um, you can also write the awk script into a file itself and pass that into awk, and then it will use that file. Also, probably the most common use, at least in my world, is to run some sort of command that generates output onto standard out, pipe it in using Linux and Unix pipes into awk, and then awk by default, if it does not receive input files arguments, it will read from standard in. So, well-designed tool. There is also another option, which we'll go into a little more detail later. You can, using the shebang, have executable all-encompassing awk scripts. So the, the only difference there is you've got to pass that dash F flag so that awk knows that it's not receiving the scripting portion as an argument, that it's receiving it from a file. Uh, but then if you do that, you can dot slash script dot awk and pass in all of your files that you want awk to process. So pretty neat. Okay, the structure of an awk program is actually very simple. And you'll, you often see one line awk programs that consist of nothing more than this. Uh, but it is useful to know that you can have as many of these pattern and actions as you want in one file. And they are typically semicolon separated. So when awk receives a command of pattern and action with action being inside of the curly braces, awk will essentially scan each input line. Each It'll scan the input and turn it into a sequence of lines. And every line that it goes through, it, it will take each line one at a time and pass it through its through the awk script. So every line is taken. It's matched against the pattern you provide. If that pattern evaluates to true, 
then the corresponding action is executed. If that pattern evaluates to false, then the action is not taken. And that's it. It's fairly straightforward and fairly simple. The real power comes in what you can do in these patterns and actions, which we will get into. But um, for now, just know that there's pattern and action. That is the main structure. So either the pattern or the action in an awk line can be omitted. If the pattern is omitted, then the implied pattern will be used or default pattern. And that pattern just simply is true. It matches every single line that comes through. So if you don't see an explicit pattern listed, then that means every line will match and this action will be taken. Same with the action, that is also optional and there is a default action and the default action is to simply print the entire line. So in these two examples, the one at the top here, we are taking every line and then printing the first column. And we'll get into the uh, columns and file separators here in a little bit. But uh, suffice it to say, the top one is just used to grab the first column. The bottom one here is a regular expression that is matched against the line, and every line that meets that will be printed. So in the bottom here, we've essentially rewritten grep, which uh, may not sound super useful, but uh, when we start combining it with other portions of awk, you'll start to see why that's pretty neat. So talking about patterns a little bit more deeply before we start looking at some examples, it's really quite easy to think of patterns as just if statements. They need to evaluate to either true or false so that awk can decide whether or not it needs to execute the action that corresponds. If the pattern evaluates to true, it's going to run the action. If false, it's going to skip it, kind of like has already been mentioned. But just think of these patterns as essentially if statements that evaluate to true or false. Here's a reference page, and this is more intended to be uh, referred back later. But this is a nice summary of the different patterns that are available in awk. There's a couple of special ones at the top listed here. Begin, any of these statements or actions that follow a begin pattern will be executed once before any of the lines have been started to be read by awk. The nice thing about that is it gives you an opportunity to initialize variables and things like that. And then there's a corresponding command end, which does the same thing except at the end. So if you've initialized variables in the begin statement, for example, you can keep track of different counts or statistics. And then in your end block, you'll get a chance to investigate the end results there. And you can either print them out or write them to a file or whatever it is that you want to do. So pretty handy. Uh, and then you've got just simple expressions. Expressions are, they can vary. And we'll get into the, the details on that a little bit more here. But uh, expressions can be very straightforward comparisons with uh, you know, greater than, equal to, that sort of thing. Or they can be regular expressions. Uh, there's also, you can use compound patterns. So the double ampersands, double pipes, I'm sure you've seen in other languages, C, C++, Java, Ruby, Python. Ba basically everything is supports you know some sort of that. Um, it's very common pattern. That is also available here in awk. And range patterns mentioned at the bottom, we'll look at a small example, but we won't go into a lot of detail. It's more about being aware that they exist. The range patterns will allow you to essentially turn on matches for some section in case you wanted to um, you know, look at, at one small section. And hopefully that will make a little bit more sense in a minute. But uh, range patterns aren't nearly as common when you need them. They're great to have, but especially while you're learning, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Here are some of the operators that you can use when you're writing patterns. And on the right, we've got some variables that are in use don't worry about those too much. We'll go into more detail about what those mean. But you can use these operators on the left to compare either literals or variables or some of the fields from your line and make a determination on whether you want to run the action. So the NF and NR variables are used frequently. So we can, we'll talk about those now. NF is the number of fields. So in each line, you are going to have a number of fields or columns. And that number will be populated in the NF variable. NR, number of records, is how many records have been read so far. So you can think of this where NR is equal to 150. Essentially, that means we've read 150 lines so far from the source. Dollar sign and a numeral, such as dollar sign one, dollar sign four, that sort of thing, 
those represent the fields themselves or the column number. So where you see dollar sign one, that would be the first column or the first field. Dollar sign four is the fourth, dollar sign fifth is the fifth, etc. So you can see here, if these patterns were used in a program, NF is less than 10, that would essentially be, let me get my mouse cursor here. I forgot I could do that for a minute. So here, NF is less than 10. That would mean that if the number of fields is under 10, then the action is run. If it's more than 10, it's not. Same with NR, number of records. This is going to mean that if we've read less than 150 lines, take the corresponding action. Dollar sign one, if the column number one is equal to the literal sum string, then that means we will execute that action. If it's not, we'll skip it. Here we're using a regular expression. So we're ta taking a column number four, we're saying if that matches the regular expression Linux, then execute the action and so on. So this uh, dollar sign five here with the not, that just means if it doesn't match. Um, this bottom one here, this is a nice example that you can do math inside of your patterns. So in this case, we're taking the value of the second column, dividing it by the third, and if it's higher than 0.5, we take the corresponding action. So pretty straightforward. Okay, string matching is what you're going to do most often, of course, uh, being an optimized language for text processing. I've kind of mentioned that there are implicit or default things in awk, and that is, a, that is something you're going to encounter a lot. In a pattern, you may see just a regular expression. So if we go back and look at the first slide you saw, in this example, we're taking and running a specific field against a regular expression. But we could have just this regular expression just completely by itself. And if we were to do that, that would use implicitly this dollar sign zero. And dollar sign zero is the entire line. So if you see only a regular expression listed as a pattern by itself, that means we're just checking it against the entire line, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it. If you have a, an expression like dollar sign four before, for example, that is the only thing that will be compared against a regular expression. And of course we can use the uh, does not match as well. And um, using that, you could come up with some pretty rich patterns. Escape sequences are alive and well in awk, just like they are in many other languages. So if you have C, Java, uh, really just about any language, uh, these escape sequences are used uh, in awk just like they are in other programs. So you can take advantage of that. Um, this is about as deep as we'll get on range patterns. I mentioned a little bit earlier they exist. Um, range patterns are just simply, they're separated by a comma, and it's a nice way of having a pattern that will match you know, a block of lines, for example. So once a line matches pattern one, it will continue to match until it matches pattern two, and then it will stop matching. So this lets you apply actions to sections, for example. If you're confused by that, that's totally normal. Don't worry about it for now. And when you're ready for it, it's not too hard to find information, so you can look it up. Okay, here's a summary on the patterns. This might be a handy reference for you later. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going over all of these reference slides, but um, just like to point out there's some pretty good examples here. Um, so with the, you know, the begin and the end, those match again at the beginning and the end of all input. And you can do expressions where you're using these operators. You can do straight string matching. Again, in this case, this dollar sign zero is being compared against this regular expression Asia. You can use these compound expressions where you see the, the double ampersands here. Uh, it could be double pipes, of course, for or, that sort of thing. And then here's a quick example of the range. Uh, in this range example, we're just checking the number of records read. If you remember, that's what the NR variable means. So in this case, we're saying apply this action to every line between line 10 and 20. So lines below 10 or above 20 will not have the action carried against them. Okay, now we've talked about patterns. Let's talk about actions, how you can actually get something done. Actions are executed every time the pattern matches. Or if you recall, the default pattern, which is true, which always matches. Actions are where Ox starts to feel a lot more like a typical programming language, such as C, for example. Inside Ox are where you can give instructions that will be carried out and interpreted by the Ox interpreter. 
inside of actions, you can do a lot of things. Essentially, anything you can imagine in a normal program is what you can do in here. So you can define variables, you can modify variables, you can call or define functions, that sort of thing. There's quite a bit of variability, and we'll look at a lot of examples here. One thing to note in these actions, the parentheses in your function calls are optional. That's something that may throw you off when you're first getting into awk. Uh, if you've ever used a language like Ruby where the parentheses are optional, then this will look a lot more familiar to you. But it is something to be aware of. And there does not seem to be general consensus out there over whether you should or should not use parentheses when it's not ambiguous. If there's any ambiguity whatsoever, definitely use parentheses. If it's not ambiguous, it's up to you. I will usually put parentheses in there unless it's just super simple like print or something like that. Um, but something that's good to know in these actions is you can override fields or column values and you can also create new ones. And we'll look at some examples of how you would do that. Here's a list of some of the statements that you can use inside of actions. So print and printf, those are actually functions you're invoking. Those would be a function call. Uh, but you've also got your control flow, such as if statements, while statements, for statements, uh, break, continue, next, etc. I won't go into details about what those do, but they do what you expect them to do if you have any sort of programming background. So you may be realizing at this point that you could write an awk program that just doesn't use patterns at all. Absolutely you could. You could do all the if checking inside the action, and I've seen awk programs that do that. It's really up to you. I wouldn't recommend doing that. I personally like to use the patterns. Um, I think that they're a lot more readable, but uh, it is kind of a nice thing to know about awk, that you can do anything inside the action block as well. You're not restricted to patterns. Awk is a deeply flexible language that provides a lot of defaults and a lot of stuff that you get for free, but it is very, very powerful. It does not restrict you from what it can do. All right, let's look at some very simple awk programs now. So it's very likely that you have seen this sort of program here at the top, um, awk print dollar sign two, uh, or maybe you've seen the one at the bottom, but the one at the top, all it simply does, if you notice, there's no pattern specified. So the default pattern comes into play here, which is always true. So this will print the second column of every line that comes through. Now let's look at the bottom one. Notice in the top one, you've got curly braces around it, which means that that is an action. But on the bottom side, you do not have curly braces, which tells awk this is the pattern. So this one just simply checks, does the third column equal the literal 10? And if it does, it takes the default action, which is to just print the whole line, print dollar sign zero. Uh, if it does not, if the third column does not match 10, then it doesn't get printed. So again, we've essentially rewritten grep using awk. I apologize, I just discovered that there was some sort of weird screen tearing before, so uh, hopefully that's fixed. If not, I will try to catch it. I wish I had time to go back and re-record the previous, but I don't, so we're gonna have to keep going, but hopefully from this point out, it won't be a problem. Okay, so let's look at some more of these simple awk programs. So this one at the top is uh, not a super useful awk program, but it is kind of helpful to understand how awk works. Again, we're using the default pattern, so every line evaluates to true, and then it takes the action print. Now, print by itself, you wouldn't think would make a lot of sense, but it uses a default argument. A lot of times with these function calls in awk, you will see that there may not be a specific argument passed, and the default ar argument is always dollar sign zero, which is again, the entire line. So. Just be aware of that. If you see something that doesn't seem to make sense because it's missing an argument, that's likely what's going on. So, awk print dollar sign zero is essentially a rewriting of the cat program, <laughs> which again is not super useful, but it's nice for knowing how things are working under the hood. Okay, I just rebooted the computer. Hopefully that will fix the screen tearing. <laughs> Otherwise, let's uh, move on. And again, apologies for the technical issues. It's amazing, I've recorded using OBS Studio numerous times, I've never had issues like this, except for when I'm trying to record something that actually matters, yeah, anyway. Okay, so uh, looking more at some of the simplest awk programs, at the top here, where we have awk, uh, we're using again the default pattern, so every line matches, 
And in this case, we're going to pass two arguments to the print function, $1 and $3. So in this case, we're printing out two columns, the first column and the third column. Now, don't get too confused by this at this point, but I wanted to point out some assumptions that awk is making here. First of all, how does awk know what a column is? That is defined by the default field separator, which is white space by default. So the columns are expected to be separated by white space, but it's kind of important to note that they do not have to be. You can change the field separator value, and we'll go into more detail on how to do that. I do use it sometimes. I, I'll change it to a colon or something like that, depending on what I'm parsing. So in this case, where we're printing the first and third column, you might would expect that these will just be one string jammed together, which would not be very useful. Awk will use also another variable, OFS, or output field separator, which you can also define yourself if you'd like, but the default is a white space. So essentially what Awk is going to do is print out the first and the third columns as two columns, and it will be processable by Awk. So you can fine tune the behavior if you'd like, but it has some great defaults built into it. Um, in the bottom example here, you can see you can also do some, some math. So for example, uh, default pattern, every line matches, so we move on to the action. In this case, we're going to print the first column as a column, and then the second column that we print or generate out of our data is the second and third columns multiplied together. So perhaps they have some sort of numerical meaning and we want to figure that out, then it's very, very easy to do an awk. And we'll look at some examples here of when you would really want to do that. Okay, here are, is a great list of some of the built-in variables. So these are the ones that you're most likely to use. You can see at the top here, we've got argc and argv, which you are likely familiar with if you've programmed in another language, especially C. Argc is the number of command line arguments received, and argv is an array of those arguments. The huge implication here is that your awk scripts can receive arguments on the command line, which can be extremely useful. And uh, it makes awk much more of a general purpose language than it otherwise has appeared at this point. File name, this variable will contain the name of the current input file. So a lot of times you're just reading from standard in, or you're just operating on a single file. In that case, this variable may not be that useful, but you can take as many file names as, as possible, passed on the command line. This variable right here will allow you to make use of that when you're deciding what to do in your actions. FNR is the record number in the current file. So uh, if you've got one file, then maybe NR, which we've already kind of looked at, which is the number of records read so far, and FNR may be identical always. But if you have multiple files, you may want to make a different decision in your blocks based on the record number in the current file and maybe the file name. So that is doable. FS, this is a very important variable. This is the field separator. So this is what I mentioned was uh, by default white space, and it's how awk knows which column is which. So by default white space, each column will be white space separated. So if we actually passed in our meaning here, controls space the space input, this would be column one, dollar sign two, dollar sign three, dollar sign four, etc. And we can change that if we need to. It's very, very simple. You just set FS to whatever you want. Uh, NF, the number of fields in the current record, this is another important variable which will tell you how many columns there are or fields. So in the case above where we were running this line through, you'd have five. So NF would be equal to five. And you can use that to also make decisions. And uh, we'll look at some examples of how uh, NF is, can be used to add columns and support arbitrary numbers of columns to be passed in. It's pretty nice. NR is another important one. This is the number of records that you've read so far. Now notice, uh, different than FNR, NR is total. FNR is in the current file. So NR would be the number of records you've read total across all files. OFMT. OFS and ORS are the output field separator and the output record separator. So one of the things we haven't mentioned before or so far as uh, this RS variable, this is the input record separator. So much like the field input field separator, the RS is the separate 
uh, the separations between records. So the default, as you can see, is the new line. So by default, each line is separated by backslash n, or line feed, on Linux systems. So the default column break is white space. The default line break or record break is line feed. That's important to know. And 99% of the time, that's probably what you want to leave it as. But it doesn't have to be. You can change this. Say that you wanted to process each column as a separate record for some reason. You could change the RS to white space, just like the FS. And then each column is going to be treated as a separate record, which would be pretty nice. So there's a lot of things you can do. I mentioned in the earlier slide, in fact, let's uh, go back and take a look at that real quick. So in this case, I mentioned that we were outputting two new columns with just the first and the third columns from the original data. This is where this OFS, or output field separator, matters. By default, it's white space, just like the input. But you could change this to whatever you want. If you wanted to output them everything on a new line, you could you know, put the line feed in there. Or if you wanted them colon separated or comma separated for maybe CSV style data, you can do that very easily with awk. So awk is extremely flexible and it has great defaults, but it allows you to override those to get done what you need to do. Those are the most useful variables. Some of these other ones you aren't likely to use a whole lot, but uh, here they are in a table for later reference if you wish. OK, um, here's an, a quick example. You should be able to read these programs now. This one at the top here, we're going to print the number of fields in every row. Again, there's no pattern specified, so it's default pattern matches every line. And then we print the number of fields. So the output here is just basically going to tell us how many fields or columns are in each line. This one at the bottom is actually a lot more useful than it probably looks at first glance. This script is basically going to add line numbers to whatever file we tell it to. So we print two columns here. The first one is just the number of records read so far, which is going to correspond to number of lines in the file because again, by default, our record separator is the line feed. And then dollar sign zero, if you recall, is the entire line. It's the whole input line. So the output here is to just essentially add line numbers. It's very, very useful. We are not limited with awk to just spitting out columns or you know tabular data. We can also add arbitrary text, which makes awk really, really useful. So in this case, we are, oh, I've got a typo in my slide here. Uh, anyway, in this case, we are printing the first column, which we assume is probably somebody's name, and then makes, and then the third column, which we assume is their hourly rate, wage per hour. So we've got a nice output here that helps us interpret the data. At the bottom here, we do essentially the same thing, except this demonstrates the printf function. And if you notice this one up top, I've intentionally written these with different styles so that you can kind of get used to some of the style differences available. There are no parentheses in this function call at the top, even though print is just a function. I added parentheses to the one at the bottom. Remember, they are optional. So it's up to you if you want to use them. But printf just uses a standard format string, which concept is in C and has been carried over to many, many different languages. Uh, we essentially use the percent %s placeholder for a string, percent %f here for a float, and the point .2 tells it to go to two decimals of precision, and then we print out the hourly wage. OK, this is not awk specific, but it's very important to point out that awk is meant to play well with tools, especially with the Unix pipe. So you can take your awk output and pipe it into other tools for very useful results. In this case, we are taking our previous output and we're piping it into the sort command, which will then sort our data based on, in this case, column three. We can also do use unique as a filter. You know, Say we wanted to just print all of the unique values then uh, here we are piping into the unique command. Uh, so this is more of a reference slide. Uh, this is the expressions that you can use in um, you know, both actions and also pattern blocks. Remember, the pattern just needs to evaluate to true or false. But uh, again, this is meant for more of a reference.
There are a number of built-in math functions which makes awk extremely useful in a statistical type of way. Uh, so uh, here's a list of functions on the left. You may not ever use some of these, but it's good to know that they exist. You can grab easily cosines. Um, you know, you can do exponents, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of lot of options here. You can even grab random numbers, which is pretty handy. These are some of the built-in string functions. These functions can be incredibly useful. You're likely to use these quite a bit if you do any sort of serious awk scripting. G sub is a global substitution. It's just essentially used to substitute values inside of strings. Uh, index will allow you to grab the first position in any sort of string, uh, basically the, uh, the index or offset from zero, that sort of thing. Length allows you to easily check the length of a string or the number of characters. Match is a quick way to test whether there's a specific substring that matches in there. Split is extremely useful. You've probably used some variant of this many times in other languages. Split just essentially allows you to, um, to take a, a given string and split it on values. So by default, it uses fs, the, fil the field separator. So you can, if you've got, say, dollar sign zero, or you've made up your own string in there, and you want to split it so that you can operate it on an, as an array, it's very easy to do with this function. Sprintf is an incredibly useful function. You've already seen printf, which allows you to do formatted strings. Sprintf, or sprintf, however you want to say it, is essentially the same thing, except rather than putting it all the way to standard out for you, it will return it as a variable so that you can either store it, save it, pass it, print it directly, or whatever you want. Uh, sub is like gsub, except it just replaces the first encounter. And substring is kind of what you'd expect if you've used other languages like Java, for example. All right, let's look at some examples here using some of the string functions. So again, I've mentioned that there, most of these functions will take an implicit argument of dollar sign zero or the entire line if you don't explicitly pass an example. So at the top here, we're using dollar sign zero the entire line. And in this case, we're calling gsub and we're saying match the regular expression USA and every match that you find, replace it with United States all spelled out. And then the semicolon here terminates that expression and moves to another statement inside of our same action. So you can see we can have actions of arbitrary length, as many expressions or statements as make sense. So in this case, we are globally substituting everywhere it says USA, we change it to United States, and then we just print out the result. Pretty straightforward. In the bottom example here, we're using sprintf to get a nice formatted string, save it to the variable x, and uh, then we can do something with it. Here at the bottom is an example of using gsub in an explicit way. Banana here, that is the input argument that we are going to operate on rather than dollar sign zero. And here we're gonna say, take the regular expression Anna and anytime you find it, replace it with Anda. So it essentially takes banana and every occurrence of banana gets changed into bandana, which probably isn't super useful, but uh, it's a nice illustration. String concatenation. If you've done any sort of string processing, you've likely run into the need to do string concatenation. It's very, very common. So of course, awk provides this. What makes it a little different in awk that you're probably used to is that string concatenation is not done with any operators. You simply put two strings together, and if they're not separated by a comma or something, then awk interprets that as concatenation. So in this case, print dollar sign two dollar sign three. If we put a comma here after the dollar sign two, then that would be telling print here's two arguments, two columns that you should print out. But there's no col there's no comma, so this tells print or rather awk concatenate these two variables and then pass them as the first argument to print. So a specific example at the bottom here, you can see print hello world. There's no comma here, so the output turns into hello world all combined. So that is how you can do string concatenation in awk. You will see that sort of thing. And if you're like me, that's going to confuse the heck out of you. So don't let it throw you off.
String literals. Okay, I've kind of hinted along so far that there are types in awk. The types are very simple, and I didn't mention them up front because awk is extremely forgiving with types, and you can use awk for quite a while and never even realize that it actually has types. There are two types, strings and numbers. Strings are what you expect. Numbers are also what you expect, but they can be you know, integers, they can be scientific notation, they can be uh, floats, essentially anything that you want. So these examples here are all valid numbers in awk. And the nice thing is that when you try to do something with a type, if it is not the correct type, awk will attempt to coerce it as needed. And it's pretty good at it as well. So if you see an error that talks about wrong types or unable to coerce or unable to convert, that's likely what it's talking about. Just make sure that you're not passing a string to a function that expects a number and the string has something that cannot be converted into a number like a random letter or something. That's usually the problem. All right, this slide is meant more for uh, reference for you later, uh, but here's a nice table of different operations that you can provide. Uh, and then the operators that will do them, and then some quick examples, and then an explanation of the meaning. So pretty handy slide to have around while you're learning awk. Um, don't worry too much about this array thing. We're gonna talk about that in a minute when we get to the deeper dive, but uh, this is a nice reference slide for you. Control flow. If you've done any sort of programming, you've likely run into the need for control flow. It's probably um, makes you very happy to know in awk, most of the standard control flow is fully supported. The syntax is a lot like C. We've already kind of looked at this a little bit in earlier slides, but we're gonna go a little deeper now. You've got your standard if else and your while loops and your for loops and that sort of thing. And those all largely work as you'd expect. Here's a total list of the control flow statements that are available. Um, you've got your statement groupings inside the curly braces, and then you've got if, while, for, do, while, break, continue, next, and exit. And all of those, again, do essentially exactly what you expect they do. Here are some examples. So these two examples on the left and right are essentially equivalent. The one on the left demonstrates using a while loop. The one on the right demonstrates a for loop. In this case, on the while side, on the left here, we're starting with a variable. Notice we don't have to declare it. We don't have to put a type in front of it. We just assign to it and awk knows what to do. So we start i, initialize it to one. And then we say, while well, i is less than nf, again, remember nf is the number of fields in the current line. So while i is less than the number of fields in the current line, print out dollar sign i. Essentially print out that column and then increment i by one and move on. So this, this uh, chunk of code here is just going to print out our entire line essentially. May not sound super useful, but you'll see why it is quite useful in a little bit. In fact, you may have already noticed we didn't have to specify the column number here since we used a variable. This allows us, by using this sort of technique, we can support an arbitrary number of columns without knowing ahead of time how many columns there are, which can be very, very useful. The same thing on the right here is written as a for loop. So standard for loop notation, expression for initialization is on the left. The center one is the test. And the one on the third is the statement to take at the end or the expression to execute at the end. So we do the same thing. We initialize i to one. We continue this loop until i is greater than the number of fields. And at the end of the loop, we increment i by one, and then we just print the column. Okay, writing output to the screen. We've already seen the print and printf functions, so this is mostly a review. But uh, there are a few new things here that I wanted to talk about. This, these statements here, the print and printf, are how you get stuff out of awk, out onto the screen. Or as you may notice here, you can also write directly to a file or you can append to a file. It's pretty standard shell syntax if you're used to bash or born shell. Print takes a variable number of arguments and tends to do the right thing. So print just takes strings directly and printf takes format strings. Uh, but notice that you can pipe out to different commands. 
So you can actually pipe to other commands if you want, or you can redirect to files or append to files. Very useful. One thing you may notice here that is a little different than modern languages is there is a close function. Um, most of the time, you do not need to worry about closing your files, but there are cases where you do. You don't want to hold files open when you're not using them. It's, uh, it's not good practice. So if you're going to be writing or opening files for a while and then doing work without using those files, it's probably best if you close them and then reopen them when you need them. There is a system function which takes a string, which is just some command to execute in the shell. Very, very useful. Here's a quick slide, a reference sheet on format string uh, characters that you can use. You've already seen percent %s, you've already seen percent %d and percent %f. These are some of the other ones you can use. <clears throat> Most of the time you'll use percent %s or d or f or um, that's by far the most common, but it's good to know that others exist and this is how you would use them. All right, now it's time to go a little bit deeper. Hopefully your head is not spinning quite yet. Let's look at some examples that get a little bit deeper. So we're moving beyond kind of single line aux scripts here. We've already mentioned writing files directly from awk. Here's an example of that. So right inside of awk here, we're redirecting the output of some expression is straight into a file name. And here we're also using the pipe and running it into some other command. Here we see that we can create and set variables. Now this is a small snippet that's part of a larger program, so it looks really uh, dumb out of context. But uh, the point here is we're actually trying to count the number of words and the number of characters in an input file. And we're trying to do it all in awk. So W is actually going to represent the number of words we have, and C is going to represent the number of characters. So we start by incrementing W using these rich, kind of the rich operators, and we increment W by the number of fields. So if you recall, the default field separator is the white space, which in, when you're processing just text files, that's typically going to mean the number of words. It's not perfect, it's not scientific precision, but it's going to get us pretty darn close. So we use W as a running total, and we increment it by the number of fields. C, we're calling the length function here. Notice we are not passing any arguments, and the parentheses are optional, so you don't see them. So it may not look like we're actually calling a function, but we are. We take the length of the current line, essentially number of characters, and we add one to it, and then we store that in a variable C. That way, at the end of our program, C has the number of characters we've processed and W has the number of words. Here's uh, probably the slide I should have been showing in the previous one, but um, so we already kind of went over what this, uh, this does here. This is how we would actually print that information so that it's useful. Remember, end is a special pattern that matches or gets run at the very end of all input. So in this, at this point, we're gonna print the number of records we read, so the total number of lines, and then W, which is the total number of words, C, which is the number of characters. So we're printing out a three column data set, which can then be used for other things. And it starts with line numbers, words numbers, uh, character numbers. So if you were writing a book on the command line in plain text, this could be a really, really useful script for you to keep track of your progress. How many lines do I have? How many words do I have? How many characters do I have? That sort of thing. It could be very, very useful. I mentioned earlier, we can also define our own functions, which is very useful and helps make awk a lot more of a general purpose language. Again, I'm not trying to imply that awk is general purpose. You probably don't want to write anything serious in awk unless it's doing text processing, but it is very, very, very powerful. In this case, we're declaring a new function. We're going to call the function add3. It takes one argument that we're going to call number. And all it does is it takes that number, adds 3 to it, and returns the value. And then down here in our pattern, we can, anytime it matches, we invoke our function. And we add the return value of our function as the first argument to the print function. So it will output 39 or whatever. You know, In this case, we're passing 36 in. So it outputs 30, 39. Arrays. Most useful languages will have arrays. Awk is no different. 
But there are a couple things about arrays in awk that are a little bit different. And at first, they may it might seem kind of limiting. But again, awk is all about having very powerful implied defaults. It tries to be extremely powerful with a minimal amount of typing. So arrays in awk are all one-dimensional. They take both strings and numbers. You can commingle and mix them in the array. Awk will not care. The arrays and the elements themselves do not need to be declared. When you want to use it, you just use it. You don't have to declare it or anything. Here's a big difference between arrays in awk and most languages. All arrays in awk are associative. Now, what that means is that they are actually more like dictionaries or hash maps or whatever your preferred language calls them. These keys are not integers. They are not memory offset values from the beginning of the array. These are, they can be strings. Essentially, it's, it's a hash map, if you can think of it that way. All arrays are associative. Now, you can still use it as though it were a regular array. See, for example, here, array of five. This will work just fine. So you don't have to think of arrays always as associative because you can still use them you know, just with index zero, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And you can do that all you like. And um, you'll start to see that it makes a lot of sense when you start using it. The way you iterate with the array, for and then variable in array. So then the value will be in this variable object or this uh, variable variable, and you can then operate on it as you need. You can delete elements from the array with the delete keyword and it's just delete array and then whatever subscript and then that will disappear. So it can be very useful. When we get to the example section, you'll definitely use some of those. Field manipulation. So. I mentioned earlier that you could do this, but uh, I alluded to a coming example that will make it make a lot more sense why you would want to. We have arrived at that example. Fields can be specified by expression. So dollar sign and then in parentheses, NF minus one, we're taking the total number of fields and subtracting one from it. This is how you would reference the second to last field. Remember, NF is the last one and you would do dollar sign NF to show awk that you're referencing the column or field number of NF, not NF itself. So this is what the syntax looks like. Dollar sign NF for minus one would be the second to last. You can also reference non-existing fields and they will be created through an assignment. So consider this scenario. We've got an arbitrary number of fields or columns. We'll just say, for sake of example, we have five. We assign, using the equal sign, the variable or the field number nf plus one. So normally that would be out of bounds. That field does not exist. We're going to create it. So this is going to evaluate to five, our total number of fields, plus one. Now we have six. So this is dollar sign six, field number six, which doesn't exist. We set it equal to the value of the second to last field column divided by a thousand. So this is now a new column that when awk runs is going to be printed out. And again, then it can be saved off to a file or piped into more tools for further processing. I've seen chains of awk that go, you know, dozens of layers deep using this sort of piping and chaining. So it can be very, very useful. Self-contained scripts. I mentioned earlier that this was a thing that you could do. Here's a more uh, complete example of actually doing it. Um, so this script does nothing. It's just a recreation of cat, um, but it's all self-contained inside of an awk script. So uh, if you copied the top part there, if you copied this into a text file, make it executable, you can dot slash it and pass a list of file names and it'll be processed on it. Pretty handy. All right. I want to look at some of the ugly, weird things that people do with awk, uh, because sometimes you'll see these examples in the wild. And right now, for whatever reason, the culture is not that of wanting to understand awk. It's just wanting to copy paste awk, which I can understand to some extent. But I've seen this example in the wild a few times. If you Google for how to strip or remove leading white space, you will see 
a Stack Overflow question where this is the answer right here. It's a very, very quick, brief script in awk, and it strips the leading white space. Let's dissect this a little bit because this, even when I knew awk, when I first looked at this, it looked so weird, I didn't see why it would be doing anything. So first of all, let's point out that we're using a lot of implied behavior here, a lot. So notice we start with a curly brace. That means that the pattern here is implied. It's implied true, so every line will match this. But then here, there's no semicolon. We just drop to a number outside of the curly brace. Well, this semicolon here is implied. So basically what we have here are two separate statements, two separate lines, but it looks like one. We've got pattern, action, pattern, where this one is a pattern, and then an implied action right here. So pattern, action, pattern, action. I rewrote it down here a little bit easier to read. I still left the patterns as implied though. But <clears throat> um, essentially, knowing that this is two lines will help you. So again, always true with the default action, that's gonna print the whole line. So what's really happening here is we're taking the first column and we're signing it to the first column. That would appear to be a no-op, and for the most part it is. But remember, awk uses fs as the field separator and by default, it's white space. When you make an assignment to a new field like this, awk is going to apply that field separator and strip off the white space. So we're essentially taking advantage of the way awk does field assignments to get it to do something that it probably wasn't designed to do, but it works very, very well by stripping the leading space. So that's kind of a handy one to hold on to because it does come up sometimes. Okay, this is one of my favorite slides, even though it's incredibly impractical. This demonstrates that awk is indeed somewhat of a general purpose language, even though it's not optimized for that, but you can do almost anything. This is actually an HTTP server written in just awk. It, you, you may see it's part of the HTTP, HTTP headers right here, content type, contact length. So it's got the hallmarks of an HTTP server. It can handle 404 not found. Uh, and quite a few things. So this demonstrates that it is very possible to do crazy things in awk. I suggest that we ship this to production immediately. Okay, we've gone over a lot here. It's probably not all gonna sink in right away and it definitely will never sink in if you don't practice. So we're going to head into the next video, which is a bunch of challenges that I developed to kind of help reinforce this material. Uh, but before we get to those, I just wanted to uh, tip my hat to some of these references. The Awk Programming Language First Edition book is amazing. I highly recommend that you obtain a copy of that and use it as a reference because it's really, really good. It's very brief, but it's quite comprehensive. Um, this tutorial here was also very useful by Jonathan Pollardy. Uh, I really liked that. And also the Wikipedia page, as I mentioned before, is actually pretty good. It's worth a read. All right, I'm going to quickly introduce the challenges um, and then end this video and we'll start the next one. But I'm gonna introduce them now so that it's a tease for you so that you do wanna watch the next video. The source code is available at my GitHub page at the top here. And our scenario, the boss has given us a tab separated value file full of payroll data and she would like us to run some analysis on it. We recently learned about awk and its amazing processing power and have decided that this is an awesome chance to use our new skills. You should primarily use awk, but you can and should combine with other tools when it makes sense. So for example, pipe it to sort, pipe it to unique, that sort of stuff. I would say though, try not to use grep or sed because awk can do the same things, can handle those same scenarios. And we are trying to use awk. If you fall back to grep and sep, uh, grep and sed, you will probably do what I did the first time and end up with a nice long piped chain, which seems kind of cool, but does a whole lot that awk can do in one statement. So try not to use that. Try to use awk and uh, let's have some fun. <laughs>